to introduce our next speaker, um, I'd like to welcome a uh, sort of Renaissance woman. Um, Maria Agudian is a journalist, a singer and songwriter, a legislative consultant, and a board member of KPFK, the Pacifica Foundation, the LA League of Conservation Voters, and a commissioner on environmental issues in the city of LA. Um, Maria? So glad you guys came. You're about to have a real treat with our next speaker. Um, I prepare, I think, to be excited and engaged and inspired because Gar Alperovitz is indeed inspiring. Um, you know, we always hear kind of the bad news. My friend Ralph Nader always talks about, you know, what we have now is the system of Chevron by Exxon and for Unical. But there's something else that is going on. There's kind of a beneath the surface, what I call a quiet revolution, a new American revolution. And it's nonviolent, and yet it is, in fact, changing what our economic system is. And this is one of the specialties that our next guest, Gar Alperovitz, researches and helps to promote, helps people to do. So it, I call it a parallel system. So you've got the corporate system, and then beneath it, you've got this parallel system going on. This is this wide range, kind of a network of cooperatives and community trusts and worker-owned companies, and they're going on all over the place, but the media just doesn't know about it. So let me introduce now Gar Alperovitz. He is a um, professor at the University of Maryland. He's the author of several books, my favorite among which is the one he's going to talk about. It's called America Beyond Capitalism. His newest book is called Unjust Desserts, and he has also been the founding principal of the Democracy Collaborative, and he oversees the project on general disarmament, and one of the founders of the Committee for the Political Economy of the Good Society. If that's not enough, he's also president of the National Center for Economic and Security <coughs> Alternatives, also worked on Capitol Hill. I won't even go into it all. He's really amazing. So please give a very warm welcome to Professor Gar Alperovic. Um, I want to start with a question that I think is on the table, but I want to speak to you not as a lecturer. And if you listen to this discussion as if it were a lecture, I suggest you leave none. So let me put it a different way. The question I would like to pose, or for you to be thinking about, is Is there anything that the person in your seat might possibly do about what we're talking about? So I'm putting it to you in a very nasty way that the problem is existential, and whether we, you and I, will do anything to move the ball. So that's the opener. Now, simply, I'm sure you've all heard this wonderful quote by Margaret Mead, but it is dead accurate, whether you stand way on the left, moderate, liberal, conservative, or not. Quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And if you think about that, think about a couple of kids in the early 60s in the civil rights, pre-civil rights era, a very small group decided they were going to sit in, sit in at lunch counters. And they made a decision to act. So, the sermon, if you like, is whether or not we have anything to do. Now, let me give you, I want to go, I want to recapitulate some of the bad news, but I am interested in what is to be done. But let me tell you about something that's going on right now in Cleveland, Ohio, for people who are, care about what might be possible. Many of you know of the Mondragon experiment in the Basque region of Spain. It is now a, it's an extremely interesting, integrated set of cooperatives and socially owned, you might say socialist or socially owned cooperatives in an integrated structure, now over 50 years old, involving 100,000 employee worker owners. Cutting edge, this is not your local co-op. This is cutting-edge research at the edge of manufacturing, high-tech, as well as services. 
the ratio of income from the top to the bottom is 4 to 1 in 80% of the co-ops. In the big ones, it is up to 9 to 1 as compared with American corporations, which are often 250 or 350 to 1. Over 50 years, it has not, it has not displaced one single person. No one has been thrown out of work. What happens is, yes, indeed, certain co-ops go up and down, but there's always room for them in the next co-op, and they're part of an integrated strategy. Now, Mondragon is not the perfect world, but it is of particular interest for the following reason. It, has, it is a successful real-world experiment that is neither state socialism, nor the cooperative, traditional cooperative, nor, in fact, the model of capitalism that's been talked about at this conference all, time, all this time. What is interesting is that in Cleveland, Ohio, a very sophisticated version of exactly that model is underway in a city, one of the devastated cities, and it is the building next two weeks from now a large-scale industrial, green as it can be, industrial laundry will open under this structure owned by the workers. There is a very large solar installation cooperative in the same structure owned by the workers. There is a development in Cleveland of a large-scale, industrial-scale greenhouse, solar power, geothermal, owned by the workers, and producing, when I say industrial scale, I was corrected. It will produce, I said, 1,000 heads of lettuce a day. No, it's about 3,000 heads of lettuce a day. There are several other on the drawing boards, and it is developing now with very interesting support. It is real work, it is constructive, it is green, it is selling in significant part to the expanding social sectors of the United States now. One of them being healthcare. Hospitals need a lot of food, a lot of laundry, and they are socialized in terms of their financing significantly because Medicare, Medicaid is one of the backbones of it. They are providing also to the open market, but providing partially to that sector. It is interesting also in that in Cleveland, a city which was 800,000 and is now 400,000, the local business community and the local labor groups are not at the same ideological pitch as what you hear on Rush Limbaugh. They're interested in what can be done practically in this community. And they are either allies or neutral or supportive. Now there's a model there. It is not the only thing I want to talk about. And I'm not a utopian. I'm a realist. I worked in both houses of Congress and the planning levels of the State Department. I know what it's about from the inside and how nasty it is. I'm also a historian. I know the name of the game and the lecture. We've had two lectures which have given us some idea of the power structure we're facing. On the other hand, there is great pain building in the United States, and there is a desperate hunger for answers, and there are interesting alliances that can be made and different visions of the future that may be possible. Now, if you listen to what I just said about the Cleveland model, if you think about it structurally, and I pose it to you that way, what you have is a local, highly decentralized, direct democracy, socialization of capital, anchored in community that is beyond just the workers, there is a broader collectivity called the community, and it is stabilizing the base of the broader community. That model, highly decentralized, and then simultaneously linked to what I will call a socialized planning system. That is large public sectors that have needs, but integrating with the local production that is of the kind I'm talking about, that is a very interesting model indeed. That is not state socialism. That's not corporate capitalism. Implicit in the DNA of that model is a different organization of radically decentralized, changing the ownership of capital in a way that benefits not only workers, but communities.